privilege so we gather around your word again we thank for the gifts of Jesus we thank for the gifts of revelation knowledge we thank for what you're about to do in this season in our lives and in the nations of the earth we thank you we thank you this morning we receive hearing ears, knowing heart, seeing eyes, in the name of Jesus. The revelation of the word will come pure. It will come strong in the name of Jesus. By the teaching of the word today, someone would be prepared for a divine visitation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Now look at your neighbor and smile. Praise God. Okay, are you ready for God's word today? It's coming heavy, it's coming strong. Irene is a teaching church, a very prophetic church, but many don't know that we actually teach more than we prophesy. Am I right? Good. So Irene is a teaching church, and um, I believe that the best way to be impacted by a thing is through teaching. If you don't, if you're not taught, you wouldn't know what to do. If you're not taught, you wouldn't know what to do. The reason your Christian life is the way it is, is either you have not been taught, or you were taught and you didn't listen, or you didn't practice what you were taught. So I believe strongly that the believer should be taught on everything. I shouldn't assume you know how to honor your pastor. I should not assume you know how to give. I should not assume you know how to pray. I should not assume you know how to prepare for a divine visitation. Assumption is the lowest level of knowledge. So, this morning I'm not assuming you know how to prepare for a divine visitation. So this morning, I'm just going to teach you on how to prepare for a divine visitation. Or what a divine visitation means and how to prepare for the same. Then. After that, next week, next week Sunday will be in the middle of the visitation. Praise God. All right. Then after that, I will jump back to my series on faith and take you on the faith journey. Praise God. So the time is upon us. Believers, clarity, the conference, and the place of prayer. Um, the Lord renamed the conference, and um, he actually called it clarity conference. But uh, because I didn't want it to be far from your mind, I said, Lord, can we call it Believers Clarity Conference this year? He said, yes, it's fine. So this year is called Believers Clarity Conference. But from next year, it will be called Clarity Conference. Praise God. Are you following me? Okay. So he begins to tell me what the Lord is about to do. And the Lord begins to tell me what he's about to do in your life, in my life, and in our lives as a church and to everyone connected to the ministry. When I heard those things, my heart leaped for joy. But um, it's not the first time God is saying such a thing to me. But many times after God has said that, you look at the outcome of um, what God said. You don't see such a thing evident in the lives of people. I imagine Moses walking up to the children of Israel, telling them about what God was about to do when they were in Egypt. He said, God is about to take you to Canaan. He must have described what Canaan looked like. He told them about the food, the, the dreams, the freedom, the houses they were living in, and all of that. After describing Canaan to so the children of Israel, many of them would have been excited. They got out of Canaan. The good news is that, or the shocking news is that most of the people that left Egypt did not make it to Canaan. Are you following me? So they, they, they heard about the divine visitation. They heard about the deliverance. They heard about everything. They rejoiced. They danced. They followed. But um, you can't find the evidence of 
Canaan in their lives. They don't have the fruit. They never ate the fruits of Canaan. Was, it, was God the problem? He always got the problem. God is never the problem. He's always a man. When we say God is never the problem, he's always a man. It's not that we're trying to exonerate God. No, that's not what I'm doing. We're trying to just show you through, through scripture. This is the pattern. So I don't want such a moment to happen again for you. And um, that is why I always teach. Anytime there is um, an announcement like that in the realm of the spirit, the first job of a pastor is to teach it. In case you become your pastor tomorrow. Praise God. <laughs> Did you hear me? The first job of a pastor is to teach it. And when pastors come to me about this is happening in my ministry, my members are not doing this. I say, have you taught it? Have you taught it? Don't just assume people, ah, oh, your members know how to honor. You know how many times I've taught honor? Even after, even after teaching many times, some people's head is still bending to the right and to the left. Are you following me? Yeah. So we receive the things of the Spirit first through teaching. Impartation does not just come by laying on of hands. It comes by speaking of the Word, teaching of God's Word. So today, I want to teach you on how to prepare for um, the divine visitation. Now, when I say how to prepare for a divine visitation, if you're a good Bible student, the first question that you ask me is, God is visiting us? I thought God lives in me. Hello? Did you hear that? Because there's some, I've dealt with all kinds of set in Christian faith. Um, different position. Some would think God is visiting me, but God lives in me. The Holy Ghost is in me. Why is it visiting me? So if God is in me, God should not visit me. If you carry the DNA of God, why should God visit you? But if you live alone, I, I believe you carry the DNA of your father, and your father has visited you once or twice. I mean your biological father. You didn't get it. Did you get it? You carry the DNA of your father, but your father has visited you. He has been to your house. He came visiting you. So how come you carry his DNA and he came to visit you? <laughs> Praise Jesus. You know, there are ways to answer people that think they know the Bible. Are you following me? So though God lives in us, we are carrying his DNA by the Holy Spirit through salvation. But there are times God comes in a tangible presence than we have experienced before. Are you following me? At times God comes in a tangible presence. He visit for a purpose. He visit for a purpose. The times like that. I hope you are taking note. Mm. The times like that. The times like that. I'll show you examples in scripture when God visited men. In the book of Luke, chapter number 19, this was Jesus' triumphant entry. He was going to enter into the city. His disciples and some folks discerned the moment. They had the right perspective and they knew Jesus was coming in triumphantly. They responded to this visitation with singing, with sacrifice, with gifts. One of the men that sowed the first seed for that, towards that visitation was the one that gave the donkey or the horse, whatever it was, donkey I think, that Jesus rode. As he came in, people laid their clothes on the ground. They laid their clothes on the ground. Some, some were singing and all of that. The teachers of the law, Bible teachers, those that have PhD in theology, they are called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are called Pharisee and Sadducees. The Pharisee looked at what men were doing and said, Jesus, well, what, what kind of nonsense is this? This, this, is, not, this is not right. What, what kind of nonsense is this? It's, can, can you show me in scripture where, where, where they ought to be doing this? Can you give me three Bible verses? So, in the matter of two to three witnesses, the truth shall be established. And they were saying that to Jesus. And Jesus looked at them keep quiet. He said, if I ask this one to keep quiet, if human refuse to experience my visitation, stones will experience it. If humans refuse to experience my visitation, stones will experience it. If humans refuse to respond to my visitation, stones will respond to it. And Jesus said, that's the text on the screen for you. See, if I ask them to kill even stones, we immediately cry out. 
You know what it begins to tell you? Follow me carefully. Don't lose me. And I don't want to lose you. Anytime God visits, man has the ability to respond to his visitation. But even in animate things, has the ability to respond to his visitation. Are you following me? Are you following me? It means that God can visit your house and you may not respond and your car that's broken down will respond. God can visit your house. You may not respond and the engine of your car that knocked can just start working. You didn't get what I'm talking about. I'm preaching to the wrong church. Are you following what I'm saying at all? Woo. Jesus said to them, he said, if I ask them to keep quiet, stones will respond. So you begin to understand that for you to experience a divine visitation, there's a response on your side that is important. A response that is important. But let's go for that. I have a long journey. And as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. 42. Saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, your day, it was your day of visitation. Don't miss it. In this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are eating from your what? From your eyes. Next. Say, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. Surround you and close you on every side. Don't miss this. One. It looked like a curse. Don't miss it. It looked like a curse. Next verse, verse 24. And level you and your children within you to the ground. Ah, Jesus, are you angry? And they will leave you, and they will not leave you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why will all of this happen to you? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Uh, uh, folks, it's not because you did not give your tithe. It's not because you did not sow a seed. It's not because you, did, you committed adultery or you fornicated. It's not because you didn't come to church early. It's not because of whatever you think you could have done. So this evil will happen to you because you did not know. You did not discern. You did not come to perspective. The time of your visitation. Woo. Or like, Jesus, it's heavy. How can all of these happen to a man simply because he missed a time of visitation? You know why? Because a time of, any time a man is visited, the things he experiences or the thing he experiences can last him for a decade. Sometimes it can last him for a year. Something can last him for months. So the protection that should have been built around him during the time of visitation that did not happen is now why the enemy is able to encamp around him, take down his house, his family, his business, and his children. So sometimes the evil that has happened to men is not because that has happened to men. It's not because God wants the evil to happen, but because the protection they should have secured the favor they should have secured, the moment they should have stepped in at a time of divine visitation, they did not experience those things or step in those, into those things. So they became like um, a house without fence, a life without favor. And now the enemy comes and like takes everything. Child, the man will now say, but I'm a Christian, but I love God. Then you begin to say all kinds of things, but I give my tithe but i sow seeds but you mentioned all the board and all the board when you are done the response to it is that you will still wait for another moment of visitation the things about the divine, divine visitation is that you don't pray them back you don't even repent of them anytime you miss it you wait you wait you can't tongue it back. Ah, I'm like, no, let it come back. No, 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 no. You miss it, you wait. You miss it, you wait. Thank you, Jesus. Divine visitation. To make the best of the divine visitation, you need to experience this moment with understanding. Do not be like the horse or like the mole. 
that is without understanding. That's Psalms 23, 32, verse 9. Don't be like one without understanding. Don't be. Understanding the will, the will of God, understanding timing, understanding season, understanding what God is about to do, what God is doing around you, requires, um, requires what I call the gifts of perspective. And this gift is not the standing of spirit, no. That's not what we say. You must know the meaning of the standing of spirit. I've taught you already in this church, right? You know what the standing of spirit means? To know the activity behind the thing, right? Good. To know what spirit is behind this. What spirit is behind that's the standing of spirit. And the ability to see into the realm of the spirit. That's the standing of spirit. It's not she's a witch or she's a wizard. Or yellow people are Ogbanje. I have like five Ogbanje in church. Praise God. My wife is number one. If that's the definition. Shall glory. Okay. So that's on the center of spirit. To know the moment, to know the times and season, to discern what God is doing, to be able to make the best of divine visitation, you need the gift of perspective. This gift comes through understanding. It comes through study. It comes, it comes through walking with the spirit of God for time. And you need this to also understand this for your life. You know, as much as I'm teaching this for what the season that is upon us, you must also understand it for your life. The times when in your own life things are happening all around you, you don't know why they are happening. Sometimes you are tired and sick of all of those things happening around you. And many times you might even give up just at the verge of, uh, of a season. Can you imagine someone that died in the wilderness a day before entering Canaan? Ah. Uh, Ah, that death is a terrible, that one is the worst kind of death in my life. I died overnight. Canaan was going to be the next morning, they were going to be in Canaan. He died overnight. Or he just gave up overnight. And you know why they died in the wilderness before entering Canaan? They didn't die because death struck. The key death used on every one of them that is killed in the wilderness was unbelief. So the moment you walk in unbelief, death had the ability to kill you in the wilderness. Uh, am I preaching? Did you hear what I just said? So they didn't die in the wilderness because they were hold. They didn't die before entering Canaan because they were hold, you know, or because they were hungry. No. Unbelief was the key that killed them. So any man that walked in unbelief, they say, no, okay, let's deal with you. So somehow you begin to see that um, in that encounter, that the children of Israel experienced, um, the, the death became a tool that God used. Because if you are going to blow the trumpet for Jericho to come down, you know Jericho was before Canaan. You know Jericho was before Canaan. Good. Oh, you don't know. She likes to start explaining that. If you are going to blow the trumpet for Jericho to come down, so that Canaan will be possible. You can't blow the trumpet in unbelief. We must all blow the trumpet in one accord, the accord of faith. Are you following me? So imagine that kind of death. And many times in your life, things may not be going the way you want. Sorrows, lack, waiting for supply, marriage, delay, whatever it is. I've understand from practice, not all the time, but I've understand from practice of scripture is that anytime there is a great sorrow, great anguish, reoccurring issues, such a person or such a community is at the verge of a new season or at the verge of divine visitation. The earth did not know that Jesus was about to come. If they understood this principle, when all the child that were Jesus' age mate when they were killed and they were so much sorrow. The prophet said there was sorrow and anguish in Ramah. That was what the prophet said. They were asked, when there were sorrow and anguish all over the land, at that particular point, if you could, if you had the gift of perspective, you would know that a new season beckons on the earth. Same with Moses. Same with Moses. So I've come to announce to you that if, you're, if you look like, if it looks like you're in a tight corner and that's been there for a while, a new season beckons. Yeah. Oh, I say a new season beckons. Yeah. A new season beckons. Don't drop dead at the verge of a new season. 
Don't. 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 Because they won't be able to bury the season with you. <laughs> don't, I'll say it again. Don't drop dead. Don't give up at the verge of a new season. Because even those that love you won't be able to bury the season with you. Imagine you drop dead just about when he's about to propose. They won't bury him with you. And they won't bury the ring with you. Hallelujah. Oh, the anointing is heavy on me this morning. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. So the way God has designed life is that um, our lives does not change. Our lives are not altered. They are not suddenly altered by what happens every day. What do we do every day influences our future and the determine who will become. But um, divine visitation is just a moment that comes out of what we do every day. Suddenly it just comes out. Suddenly there's just a moment. A moment that separates everything. A moment that separates all that you have been waiting for. Just come quickly. But you know the sad thing is that I've seen people conduct deliverance for their new season. I've seen people conduct deliverance for their new season. You didn't get it. You still not gotten it. I've seen people conduct deliverance for their new season. Let me give you a simple example. So there's a moment, a season that is coming. The season comes with this weight. This weight. Maybe the weight of something as big as $100 million. Or comes with ultimate material like 24 yards. Then you are tired of waiting. Then you now got yourself delivered from waiting. Through prayer, through agony, through seed. Then God now gave you now found one um, three yard Osama material. <laughs> While you have been waiting and 24 yard Osama material has been worth waiting for you. Or you look at it and say, no, 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 no. I'm tired of it. Not say stay in that season. That is your territory. Wait. You are about to enter in this season. You are not even hearing what God is saying. No, no, I'm moving to Canada. Is that not everybody's way? I'm moving to Canada. And you carry your load to Canada. And you just missed. You just missed a moment. A moment. A moment that belongs to you. Am I saying you're wrong to go to Canada? I'm not saying so. And that's not what I said. It's good to go. I even pray for people to go sometimes, if it's your place. Hallelujah. So it's very possible, it's very possible that you pray yourself out of a season. What I'm saying, another word for, for divine visitation in the Bible is what I call Kairos. A Kairos moment. This moment, this moment represents a moment of critical making period which are afford mentioned by God waiting for a man to align. It's called the fulfillment of things or the appointed time. Then the daily time you spend every day is what, we, what is called um, Kronos moment. The order of time. The sequence of time. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's Kronos. But when something sudden happens out of the daily it's called the what? It's, it's called the Kairos. It's called the Kairos. I've seen people do the right thing and they miss, they miss Kairos. I've seen people do the right thing and they miss the moment of divine visitation. Do you know in the time of Jesus, when Jesus was entering the city triumphantly, the priest did not express the time of divine visitation. You know what he was doing? He was busy in the temple sacrificing, offering animals when the real sacrifice was in the city. Was he doing the right thing? Yes. But they missed a time of divine visitation. So you can be doing the right thing. You can be sweeping the church. You can be arranging envelopes. You can be typing out the Bible verse in the media. You can be singing. 
during the time of divine visitation and still miss it. <laughs> Sir, if you don't know how to walk into one. So what makes you a particle of a divine visitation is not presence. That's actually the least. It's not presence. That's actually the least. Imagine Abraham did not discern, did not have the gift of perspective when the Lord visited him, when the Lord visited his city or his village at that time. Abraham saw those angels and said, this must, these guys are not ordinary. Brought them into his house. And Sarah had got the rumor what she had been waiting for. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. You remember what I've taught you on the faith lane? Sarah needed to hear the word from God. Abraham discerned the gifts that came. and said, no, these are men sent. And that was what reduced, or that was what got Sarah on the faith lane for a child to come. Imagine he missed that time of divine visitation. God works in times and seasons. Say that with me. Say that after me again. God works in times and seasons. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3 verse 3 says, It's a time to kill and a time to heal. There's a time to break down and a time to, bu to build up. God works in times and seasons. In Galatians 4.4, 4, the Bible spoke about a fullness, the fullness of time. So, God works in times and seasons, but there are times when time becomes full. There are times when time becomes full. And when something is full, you know what happens? It is an outburst. There's a breakout. There's a throwing up. Or there is a delivery. So in God, there is what is called the fullness of time. The fullness of time. But if you don't know how to discern fullness of time, or how to, if you don't have the gift of perspective to know that this is the fullness of time, or this is when time is full, you won't experience it. When time is full, outcomes are altered. You don't get the kind of result you ought to get, or you usually get. When time, when the time is full, it crowns effort with, with, with things beyond your expectation. When time is full, supernatural favor is activated. There's something that shocked me when I was reading scriptures. I never understood that text. I'm a very open teacher. There's something that shocked me in scripture. I never knew it was that. I've quoted that scripture over the years. Until I was studying and preparing for this season. That's when the Lord opened my eyes to see it. I returned and I saw under the sun. I know you all know it. That the race is not what? And the battle is not what? Nor bread to the what? Nor riches to the man of... Nor favor to what? Men of skill. But time and what? Happen to... Okay. What have you thought about this verse? You have read it over the years. What does it say? Now, if you look at this text, the text is actually enumerating laws and outcomes. That's what he's doing. The, the preacher there says to you that usually it is the guy that is the fastest that wins the race. That's normal. I ran when I was in school. The battle goes to the strong guy. That's the expected. That's normal. Bread is to the wise. The man that is wise, we have bread to eat. That is normal. Riches flows to understanding. Yes, that is what the Bible says by understanding is a house built through wisdom and they are filled with goodly things. So riches flows to understanding. Favor to men of skill. When you are skillful in whatever you do, favor will find you. There's a spiritual side of favor, but also there is a diligent side of favor. So when you are skillful in what you do, favor will find you. Then the man now said, that is the usual law, but I saw something different from it. I said, okay. You know, when we read, I saw something different from it. The only thing we read is that, okay, but time and chance happen to them all. What is time and chance that happens to them all? So the, the, the preacher is saying that the only way to alter this outcome, in case you are going to the battle and you're not the strongest, I, uh, in case you are expecting favor from your workplace and you're not the most skillful, in case you, you are going to a race and you're not the fastest, there is a way to get an outcome that does not align with the law. It says the way is time and chance. And what time and chance in the Hebrew is opportunity. In the Greek is kairos. 
So he's saying to you that the way men get outcome that is not consistent with their effort is when they step into Kairos moments. The way men get outcome not consistent with their effort, amplified beyond their effort, is when they experience divine visitation. Are you following? When they experience divine time and chance happens to them. Kairos happens to them. It's a strange irony. Or when you are the smartest in the house and you're not getting what you think you deserve. Look for a divine visitation. And I'll show you how to initiate one. I'll show you how to initiate one. Because divine visitations are not just time when God wants to visit. No. Mm -mm. They're not. Many times we have taught divine visitations when God wants to visit. No, they're not. Divine visitations are initiated by prophecy. Indicated by prophecy. Initiated by prophecy. Extinct by prophecy. I, uh... Now, the reason people miss divine visitation, I'm still on that. I'm not done. I'm, not, my, I'm still far. Men, one reason people miss divine visitation is that it comes dressed like work. It comes dressed like usual meetings. It comes dressed like a usual festival. It comes dressed like a usual conference. It comes dressed like Christmas. It comes dressed like the things we experience every day, every time, time in, time out. So, people miss it. It's another conference now. I'll go for two out of three. I will attend two sections out of five. I will attend six out of seven. And you didn't know when your time of divine visitation would come. The reason is that when God is about to visit, it works everything behind the scene. It works everything behind the scene. Every little detail is part of the visitation. But you may not know. Every little detail. He puts one thing first. The order that have been written, but it just alters the order. I say, no, 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 no. They shouldn't sing first. They shouldn't pray first. This is what should happen first. Or this should not happen first. This is what should happen first. Every tiny detail, God is involved during a moment of divine visitation. Have you thought about Jesus coming to the earth and all the things that went into his coming? You know, uh, for Jesus to be born, a woman called Anna needed to be born first. For Jesus to be born, a woman called Anna had to get an husband first. Marry first. Husband died after seven years of marriage. So why you were weeping for Anna? Ah, Anna has lost her husband. Anna has lost her husband. Ah, sorry, Anna. You have lost your husband and all of that. You are crying for Anna. God is looking at you because God is preparing the earth for a divine visitation. Now, in that thing you called um, loss or agony or pain for Hannah, Anna found perspective, the gift of perspective. Anna found perspective and said, no, henceforth, I'm going to worship God. Seven years married, I can remarry, I'm still a young lady. Anna said, no, I'm, young, I'm going to worship God with fasting and prayer for the rest of my life till Jesus comes. So Anna went to the temple, began to live in the temple, fasting and praying. May I say to you today, fasting and prayer is worship. If she fasted and she prayed until Jesus appeared. How many years? I don't know. But she fasted and prayed until Jesus appeared. And when Jesus appeared, Anna testified about how long she had prayed for Jesus to appear. Every little detail, God was walking behind the scene to make sure a Kairos moment happened to Israel, happened to the earth. And God used every man, every man, every woman that needed to be involved. You are just a tiny little uh, piece of the puzzle. Praise God. When divine visitation is about to happen, every disjointed details will begin to make sense. When it happens, you're not because ah, oh, so that was why God took me to Iran. 
Oh, that was why I met Bishop Faye. Okay, this is why this happened. Oh, that was why that guy broke up. Oh, thank God he did. Oh, that was why that man left me. Oh, thank God he did. Oh, that was why I lost that job. That was why every tiny detail now begin to make sense because now you have been divinely visited and time has been breathed. Glory to Jesus. The change you desire happens during moments of divine visitation. Moments of divine visitation will require your focus. Look at Elisha and Elijah. If they ask you, why did Elisha receive the mantle from Elijah? You will say, because he said, yes, that's one. Because he said, but it was not the only one that said. Praise God. He followed. He told his master what he wanted. The master says, if you can see me, if you can see me go, if you can just see me go. So what am I saying to you, Elisha? Stop looking around. Just focus. Stop looking around. Just focus. Just focus. Just focus. Just focus. And when the wild wind came, separated himself, separated Elijah from Elijah, the young man screamed, Sir, I have not lost focus. My father, my father. And the man too dropped. I hope you know how quick, if you have experienced angelic activity before, you know how quick the wild wind would have separated Elisha from, Elijah from Elijah. Many times, the vision I tell you in 15 minutes, I see it in less than one second. I'm trying to explain angelic activity. If I'm prophesying to you and I'm telling you something for 15 minutes, that thing, many times, I saw it in less than one second. It just come. And I will talk for 15 minutes, tell you all the things I saw, and I'm not done. So imagine how quick. It's actually shorter than the twinkling of an eye. But Elisha did not miss it. Elisha did not miss it. So I wonder how people get distracted when they are expecting moments. I wonder why people doze up when they are expecting moments of divine visitation. I, I wonder. It's a mystery. And it cannot be found in scripture. Praise God. The God in, in divine visitation is when God is, is God's strategic timing in his calendar where he ushers us into a new season. I've come to announce to you that the Lord is ushering into a new season. Yeah. God is a God of times and season. And you are man. I say he's ushering into a new season. Yeah. Divine visitation are quality they are qualitative times. It's not about the quantity. It's not about the length of the conference. It's not about the length of the meeting. Oh, it's a three-day or one-week meeting, one month. No, it's not about the length. It's not about the length. It's a qualitative time. Divine visitations are, are windows in a season where something is available and something is possible, there's, a, there's grace for a particular thing at that particular moment. Have you, heard, have you noticed that there was just time, even in the country, when it was just easy to make money in a particular sector? Maybe to make money in oil, it was just easy. To make money in telecom. I know people that made billions in telecommunication when it came. I, I, had, a, I had a particular in-law that made... He's, he doesn't have anything doing anymore. He's just living up the money he made in telecommunication in the early 2000s. 99, 90, 2001. Is that's what? He, my, you know, that's all. In that season, within one, two years, he built more than 25 houses. He bought houses built. That's what he's living off. That was a season. It was, you can't make that kind of money now. Even, I don't care how anointed you are. It was a season where something is possible, when there is ease. When there is ease. Those windows are not forever open. They are only open for a short while, for a time. So don't think 
I'm going to listen to the message or I'm going to uh, another conference will come and then no, 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 no. If you miss a moment of divine visitation, you have missed it. The response to do is what? You just there. Wait. You wait. You wait. You wait. And when God is beckoning on a visitation, what, do, what will man do? The first thing we do is that we initiate it by prophecy. When Jesus was come, the prophets began to cry, unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. That visitation was initiated by prophecy. So when we are expecting divine visitation, we don't keep quiet. When we are expecting divine visitation, we don't keep quiet. What do we do? We talk. We talk. We talk. We talk. We talk. We talk. All right, let's go further. How do I prepare for divine visitation? Is it even possible to prepare for a divine visitation? Is it possible? Amos chapter number 4, verse 12. It must fall 12. Is it possible to prepare for a divine visitation? Yes, it is possible. Therefore, thus I will say, I will do to you, all Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to do what? Meet your God. I know you have used the Bible verse of funerals. I know people use the Bible verse of funerals. When somebody dies, they are prepared to meet your God. That's not what he said. So we can prepare to meet God. Praise God. We can prepare to meet God. Praise God. Let me give another one. Exodus chapter number 19, verse 10 to 11. Preparation is required. It's important. It's possible. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. That's one of the things you are going to do to prepare for this conference. We are laughing. That's one of the things you are going to do to prepare for this summer decision. You will wash your clothes ahead. I'm sending all my suits to dry cleaners tomorrow. We got throughout the conference, we are dressing corporate. And I'm going to, I, my suits, all of them need to be ready. Praise Jesus. You don't know, it's part of the preparation. It's God talking to Moses. It's in your Bible. It says, uh, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. And let them wash their clothes. Next verse. And let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So you should prepare to meet God. You prepare. You take permission off work. You prepare. It's part of your preparation. You save money up for the meeting. You prepare. You save money off to lodge in the hotel. You prepare. You save money up to eat. You prepare. When you break your fast, glory to God. Pre prepare. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's part of the preparation. So you can prepare to meet God. See, I'm going to prepare. So I've started preparing right now. Hallelujah. What happens during moment of divine visitation? Let me take you there. What happens during moment of... Am I preaching good this morning? Okay. What happens during moment of divine visitation? 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 verse 18. What I call... I call it transformation. Transformation. But all but we all with veiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord. When the glory of the Lord appears, we behold it as in the mirror. What happens to us? We are what? We are transformed. Transformed. Transform means to exceed the form that we wear. Trans means to move. Form. So we move beyond the original form. So say to yourself this moment. This season that is before me is my moment of divine transformation. Hallelujah. Number two, what happens to us during divine visitation? Write them down. Right. What happens to us during divine visitation? There's an overwhelming consciousness of God's presence. He lives in us. He visits us. And we carry his presence tangibly into places. There's an overwhelming consciousness of God's presence during divine visitation. Look at what the prophet said in Isaiah chapter number 6, verse 4 to 5. He says, And the posts of the door were shaken, and the voice of him who cried out, and the voice of him who cried out, and the smoke, and the, and the house was filled with smoke. Right? Follow? That's an, that's, a, that's an example of the presence. Verse 15. And so I said, when I experienced the presence, it was too pure. It was too heavy. I could not but say, what is me? For I am 
undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What has just happened to me? My eyes are seen the king. Now, you are not a man of unclean lips because you have been made clean by the blood of Jesus. But the moment you see the king, the beholding of his glory will reduce you. You see yourself as nothing. You will see yourself as nothing. You'll be conscious of his presence. You'll be conscious of what happens to you, what just happened to you. When a man expresses the divine visitation, when he leaves that place to another place, people look at him and they say, you glow. They will look at him and say, there's something about you. What just changed? What just happened to you? What just happened to you? Let, let, me, let me tell you something. During the week when I was in church to pray for people, what people were waiting for me to see them, um, I had been taking note for the meeting. There was a time of encounter I had, and the Lord was just telling me about the meeting. So I, I, I began to write, I began to type, I began to type. These days we type more than we write, right? So I began to type, and I was typing and all of that. When I was done with that, I stepped out to pray for whoever I was going to pray for. Now, I was not praying to come and pray. I was not praying or meditating to come and pray for whoever I wanted to pray for. I was just waiting to come out and that encounter came and I took note. When I took note, I went to pray. We hear the testament of what happened later. But what I wanted to say was, when I prayed, when I was done praying, someone came to me and said, Sir, when you came out of that office, you had a glow. He said, you had a glow. You, a countenance was upon you. Now, I could have just said, oh, I prayed for 10 hours now. You don't understand. Uh, nah, that was not it. That was, I was just, my, my, my mouth was just like the pen of a ready writer. And my heart was indicting a beautiful thing. That was all. About the visitation that is going to happen to you. So the man that took note about the visitation, his countenance has changed. Let alone the one that experiences the visitation. Oh. Are you following me? When we are divinely visited, people around us, they see the change. And they begin to ask you, where did you go? Did you go on a vacation? What happened to you? They begin to ask you questions. The moment of divine visitation is not just when we get material miracles. Take note. Material miracles are beautiful. They will come. But material miracles can come without divine visitation. Hello. Did you hear me? They can come without divine visitation. What we are receiving is beyond the material. Are you following me? Material will come so that carnal men can have proofs and testimonies about what happened to us. But beyond that, divine visitation puts on you what money cannot buy. Hallelujah. When the man is divinely visited, the zeal of the Lord's out consumes him. Design, divine visitation turns our eyes away from ourselves and it turns it to God. It turns it to what makes the heart of God beat. Hallelujah. All right, let me give you a third point on um, what happens to us during divine visitation. It launches us into God's purpose and plans. When a man is divinely visited, even if he knows his purpose already, is more conscious of the same. It launches us into God's purpose and plan. In the message, in the moment, in everything that will happen, you will see purpose standing before, before you. You will, see, you will see God's plans becoming clearer at those moments. Hallelujah. Now, how does God visit? Write it down. I need to let you know. How does he visit? How does God visit? 
because somebody may be expect, expecting one actor with long hair, Jesus beard, the actor, the passion, to walk into the room. Since Bishop has been talking about this divine visitation, how does God visit? How does God visit? Let me show you. Genesis chapter number 50, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you. Did you see that? God will surely visit you and will bring you out. How do you know that he has visited you? What will he do? He will bring you out of the land, of this land, to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, Joseph saw slavery ahead. Joseph saw bondage ahead. He says God will visit you. The proof that he has visited you is that he will take you out of the land. How did he take them out of the land? He sent Moses. So how does God visit? He visits through men. He visits through men. If you are not writing, you are cheating yourself. He visits through men. Luke chapter number 2, verse... Let me just give you two to three witnesses in the Bible. Luke chapter number 1, verse 67 to 68. Now his father... Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. How did he redeem his people? Through Jesus. He sent them a man. Luke chapter number 7, from verse 15 to 16. That's how they teach the Bible. So, he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. And fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen amongst us, and God has visited his what? His people. The prophet came, the man came, prayed for the dead child, the dead child was healed, and the people saying, God has visited us. How did he visit them? Through a man, through his prophet. Glory to God. So when you are expecting a divine visitation, as much as your heart is open to all that God is about to do, your eyes must be focused on the man he's about to use. You didn't hear me. When you are expecting a divine visitation, as much as your heart is open to all that God is about to do, your eyes must be focused on who the man God is about to use. Because God will only visit, will always visit. Through men. How did he visit Cornelius? Through a man called Peter. 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 So now, I'm going to do this two in one. I'm closing with this last phase. How do I initiate and receive a divine decision? Because there are times that you must know how to prepare for it. Things you must do to make it happen. And how do you receive it even when it is happening? Are you getting blessed this morning? How do I? Matthew chapter number 23 from verse 38 to 39. Matthew 23, 38 to 39. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, Jesus speaking, for I say to you, you shall not see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus said, for you to receive me, you must say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So for every man that has received divine visitation from whoever, irrespective of class, status, or age, that person must have said, to that divine visitor that blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So now you begin to understand so Cornelius the educated to have received Peter the uneducated he must have said to Peter the uneducated the broke one blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. One experience of divine visitation that stands out for me in the Bible is Cornelius. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 
10. Cornelius began to tell us what happened to him. In verse 4, I hope you know Cornelius, right? I hope you know Brother Connie. Do you know Brother Connie? If you don't know Brother Connie, you are on a long thing. Because Brother Connie is the reason there is Irene today. Okay. You don't understand. I'll get there. You see, don't get it, right? Don't worry. Follow me. I'm a teacher. I'll show you. <laughs> and he observed him and was afraid and said, Lord. And he said, what is this, Lord? So he said to him, Cornelius, the reason I'm here is because your prayers and your arms has come up to God as a what? As a memorial. As a memorial. So how did Cornelius initiate a divine visitation? He says, through prayer, his arms, that was how. His giving and his prayers initiated it. But not just his prayers. Go to verse 30. This was when Cornelius was saying it by himself. So Cornelius said, Cornelius said, four days ago, I was what? I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So Cornelius was saying the thing that was reported in verse 4. This was how it happened to me. I did not just pray. I've been a prayer for Christian. I fasted. Hallelujah. How I experienced divine visitation was that I fasted and I prayed. And I didn't break my fast in the morning. I fasted till evening. The ninth hour. And the ninth hour is three o'clock. Yeah. So that's why you're breaking your fast at three. You didn't hear. Yeah. Have you read the document I sent to you? Yes, you should know everything here is prophetic. I don't just talk. I was given the scripture before this meeting came. Praise God. He said, I fasted the ninth hour. So divine visitation does just happen. It happens through fasting and what? Prayer. The man that wants to receive this visitation must prepare his heart through fasting and prayer. It's not the kind of prayer you have been praying before. Joko, 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 loko, 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 You have been walking around. She will say if you pray. Loko, 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 loko. I'm praying now. Loko, loko, loko. If I don't pray now, Bishop will come and say, did you pray today? Loko, 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 loko. No! Not that kind. When you are tired and the burden is too much for you to bear and you know you have done all that you know to do and you want a visitation, you will pray differently. May I ask you, do you think Anna was, Anna liked what was happening in her house when um, um, the other woman was mocking her for not having children? Anna did not like it, but she was not tired of it. Anna did not like it, but she was not tired of it. The moment she was tired, she went to the temple. She removed her wig. She removed the eyelashes. She removed the nails. And she prayed like a drunk woman. When you are tired, there's, there's a difference. When you are tired, the posture in the prayer or place of prayer is different. It's different. It's not the yana van, the hon, the hon, the con, the hose, the ha. Hey, oh, oh, so you don't want your suits to tear. Hey, oh, 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 fratana, ve, ve, vida, ive, ne, ve, helco. Oh, I'm lifting up holy hands and holy nails. Oh, glory, the galava, never. No! You are not tired yet. You are not. You are not. You are not ready for a change yet. When you are ready for a change, you shut your door, shut your window, you scream. And sometimes when you are praying like that, Jesus looks at you. He says, is that how I walked into my own purpose? I prayed and, and, and sweat came out like drops of blood. Is that how I did it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I know I shame you. <laughs> Praise Jesus. You pray. With fasting and prayer. You fast and you pray. And listen carefully to me. Let me say this. When you fast and pray and you, and you, are, you are moving in the realm of the spirit, don't be afraid. Because you might pray to a point and you are getting scared of the kind of things you are feeling. 
You can pray to a point and you think, I'm about to lose my voice. You can pray to a point and you begin to feel something strange. An energy different from the energy you used to feel in your life before. It's very, very possible. You know, see, listen carefully. The realm of the spirit is like bus stops. When you, are, when you are flowing in there, you are going from one point to another. One point to another. After going from one bus stop to another, you leave the road. You get to the express lane. When you get to the express lane, the way you drive on the express lane is not from the way you drive on a regular road. Am I right? All right. Good. So when you get to such lane and you think there's an outburst in your spirit, don't hold it back. Release the car. Flow. Flow. You are touching things in the realm of the spirit. You are shifting things. You are shifting things. Now imagine, imagine now. Imagine Cornelius did not pray. Imagine Cornelius did not fast. Imagine Cornelius said, I have ulcer. I have ulcer. I cannot pray. I cannot fast. Imagine Cornelius said, I have ulcer. I cannot fast. Imagine Cornelius said, I have, um, um, I'm hungry. Doctor gave me a report. I cannot pray. Imagine. If that ever happened, if that had happened at that time, you may not have Gentile churches today. It was because of Cornelius that we now have Gentile Christians, that we now have Gentile ministers, that we have Irene today. Because he was the one that brought the gospel to the Gentile world. Imagine. So now it's time for you to pray too. It's time for you to prepare for a meeting. You are giving excuses. Many times what you don't know is that when you begin to pray for things like this, for a visitation, you don't know you are authoring things for your grandchildren. You don't know you are authoring things for cities. You don't know you are authoring things for nations. You don't know you are authoring things for your family, for believers. You don't know. Because you are only, you're always myopic. It's just about the bills have to be paid. You have not paid the rent. No, there is something more than that. Something more. Something more. You don't give excuses. Because you don't know the hands you are moving. You don't know the things you are shifting. Maybe if you had prayed many years ago, maybe that child wouldn't have died. Maybe if you had prayed many years ago, that husband wouldn't have backslided. Maybe if you had prayed many years ago, that father wouldn't have died. Maybe, 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 maybe. Thank God Colinius prayed. Thank God he didn't sleep during sex. Thank God he didn't doze off. Thank God he didn't sleep during his prayer time. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. One way to initiate and prepare for divine visitation is through prayer and fasting. Another point there is true giving. I'm never ashamed of teaching you how to give. Even though I don't have a culture of telling you, come and give. Believer's Convention is here. And I've taught you. I said, I want to teach you to the point that when you hear the announcement of a meeting in church, you give without nobody asking you. You don't need to be told now, Believer's Convention is here. This is the cost of the meeting. How much are you giving as a seat? No! That's a baby. And you're living a fake Christian life. You know it's going to happen. There's a calendar in the church that is going to happen. Oh, this is the moment I need to give in to. You should have done that on your own before it is mentioned. Whether it is mentioned or not, you should do that because you are partaking of a season. Cornelius was told the reason this divine visitation is happening is because of your giving, of your seeds. And it was not just Cornelius alone. Solomon did the same thing. God showed him, Solomon, what do you want? Your giving has ascended to heaven. Hallelujah. One way, second point, to partake of a divine visitation, you give like you have never given before. You will give like you have never given before. Nobody's going to come to ask you. I'm not going to come and ask you how much are you giving. No. And I'm not going to send anybody to you. You will give like you have never given before. You will give sacrificially towards it. Hallelujah. That's actually the third point. The first point is blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. That is honor. I'm going to come back to that. The second one is prayer and fasting. The third one is giving. 
Now you know I'm listening to that so that is to make preaching simple. So that you can go back to your note and check. The third one. <laughs> In God's context, God doesn't like it when, when a visitation that is prepared for a people is experienced by one man. And even when, man, when a man experiences God, he's divinely visited by God for himself, by himself, him alone. The goal is for others. The Bible said he sent a word to Jacob and it lighted over Israel. What it means is that when God is visiting me, he's visiting me because of you. And when God is visiting you, he's visiting you because of your friends, your family, your enemies inclusive. Cornelius knew this. He knew how to prepare for divine visitation. I don't understand. I know the man was well taught. He knew it. Look at it. Verse 24 of the same chapter. Read for me everyone. Want to go? And the following day, when, okay, now Cornelius was watching for them and called and had called together is what? Who did he call together? This is how to receive a divine visitation. If you are coming alone, you are not ready for it. He called, I'm not lying, I'm not telling you because I want somebody to come. I'm telling you what I'm saying in the Bible. He called his friends and relatives. Are you seeing that? And when his friends and relatives were ready, seated, what happened? Peter came in. So you don't walk into divine decisions alone. No. No. Verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell to the ground. Fell down at his feet to worship him. Honor again. Peter said, don't worship me. I'm a man like you. But you can honor me. So that shows Cornelius at posture. Honor. He's a man that I said, blessed is the man that comes in the name of the Lord. I don't care how educated or uneducated Peter is. I don't care if Peter gets all his tenses right or he doesn't get his tenses right. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. I'm ready to receive from that man. I'm ready to receive. So your art posture for a meeting like this is to say to yourself, I'm ready to receive from my man of God. If there were lists of preachers, you would say, I'm ready to receive from all these preachers. And you would say to yourself, every word that comes from his mouth during this meeting, I take them as God's word to me. You say that to yourself. Every word that comes from him during this I take as God's word to me. And you will esteem it as the same. When they were ready, Peter showed up. Peter showed up. Peter showed up. Peter showed up. Publicity. Inviting your friends. That's the next way to prepare for a meeting. For a divine visitation. The next one is honor. Then the last one on my list is what I call corporate hunger. Corporate hunger. And that is why many times divine visitations don't last. That is why many times we are divinely visited and only a few partake of it. Or what ought to come like a flood now ends up like raindrops. What ought to come like a flood now ends up like raindrops. You know why? Because we are not hungry at the same level. Because some are hungry and some are not. The people gathered and they were waiting for Peter. Hunger, corporate hunger. The 120 did not experience the move of the spirit because they were 120. No! Or because Jesus said it will come. No. Or it will come. No. They experienced because they were in one accord. One level. Same level of hunger. Both were hungry. All of them were hungry. All of them were hungry. All of them were hungry. So while somebody is coming to that meeting. Hungry. Another one is coming to that meeting. To catch babe. Glory to God. Another one is coming to that meeting. To check if the choir can sing very well. Another one is coming to that meeting. To check if bishop... Is is the real bishop of Iran, or if all the things that we see on social media is true? Okay, can he really, really prophesy? People are coming for different kinds of reasons. So, what ought to come like a flood comes as drops. 
And let me say this to you. It happens in every area of our lives. It happens in giving. You know, when you look at the principle of, of the first tent, there's a blessing for the man that is giving it. And there's a blessing for the house. The reason many times the house has not experienced the blessing of the first tent is because the house does not give first tent properly. Because this is giving first tent, this one is not giving. That one is giving, that one is not giving, that one is giving, that one is not giving. So the blessing also comes as a, on a house for giving first tent doesn't come on the house because um, we are not all pas- practicing the same what? Principle. What ought to come as rain, as, as a flood. Now it comes as what? Raindrops. So you must come into this meeting with hunger. Say hunger. Say hunger. Say I'm hungry. Not food though. I mean hungry. Hunger in your spirit. Hungry for what God will do. Hunger. Hunger. You know, see what Psalm 31 verse 1 says. Look at it. It says, how good and pleasant is he is for brethren, for brothers to live together, to dwell together in unity. Unity. Together. In unity. In unity. Verse 2, it says, it's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down from the bread. Running down on the bread. Running down on Aaron's bread, down upon the collar of his robe. It is as if, it is as the dew of Ammon falling, as if the dew of Ammon was falling on Mount, or on Mount Zion. For it is there, that's where I'm going. For it is there. It is in that unity. It is in that unity. It is in that unity that God commands the what? The blessing. So it's a meeting you come in with one accord. Not angry with one person. Not angry with this other person. Not saying that person offended me two years ago. You offended me three days. From the day I was inaugurated, you offended me. And the day I will be de-inaugurated in heaven, I will keep the offense. Praise God. If you're not just like that, I've seen them. I've seen somebody told a believer, I said, no, I will forgive you when we get to heaven. I've seen it before. In the church I used to attend. Ridiculous. When we get to heaven, I will forgive you. I said, Are you sure you even get to heaven? <laughs> because this, this attitude, I'm not sure you have the life of Christ in you. So it's not that kind of meeting. It's not the kind of meeting you come in chatting and talking or eating gum. It's not the kind of meeting you come in playing. No, it's not that kind of meeting. It's not the kind of meeting you are coming to catch crews or catch up with a friend. Not that. I'm telling you now, not that kind of meeting. If you don't want to hear me yell at you in the coming days, you better don't mess yourself up. It's not that kind of meeting. You're coming in pressing your phone and walking downstairs, playing somewhere, picking up in the corner. Not that kind of meeting. It's a meeting you get into. Hours before the meeting starts, you sit down. You sit down. Directing your focus. Using your words to give direction to God's power that will come up in that meeting. That will show forth in that meeting. It's a meeting you get into seated. Hours before it's praying. Setting up your heart. The moment you hear, welcome to Believer's Clarity Conference. You're high. Your, your spirit is high already. It's that kind of meeting. It's that kind of meeting. And your preparation must be the same. Don't care about what any other person is doing. Don't care. Know your roster from your department if you are seven. When am I seven? When am I not seven? No. Take a seat. Hours before, minutes before, sit down and begin to pray in tongues. Set your desires right. It's a meeting you must come with goals. Specific spiritual goals and specific personal goals. Come in hungry. You will never be filled beyond your level of hunger. Never. 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 Kadivra na hasuti hitivane. In the meeting. This will be activated. There will be impartations. There will be miracles. Unplanned miracles. There will be clarity. There will be direction. There will be clarity in understanding. 
If you do all that I've said to you, you know what will happen to you? You won't even know you have been changed. When Moses went out of vis visitation with God and was with God for some days, when Moses came back, no one knew he had changed. Even Moses did not know. His eyes were now like so bright like the sun. When he came down and went to the people that had always known him, he said, sir, we can't look at you. We can't look at you. Something has changed. We can't look at you. So men will not be able to do the things they did to you before that time, before that conference, before the conference. You will come back and where they rejected you will be accepted. Because during those moments, you would have been transformed. You would have been transformed. You would have been changed. You would have been changed. Set your desires right from now. All the things, all the to do, make sure you do them. From all, to fasting and prayer, to giving, to publicity, to inviting people personally. To gathering. And to hunger. Make sure you do all of them. So that you won't say another believer's clarity conference has come and gone. No. Santi Yofi, Kadivra, Nasotahaya. There will be the move of the Spirit in the meeting. There will be prophecy. I'm not planning or praying to prophesy. There are just things I would. Only thing I'm doing is I'm just yielding. Lord, what do you want me to do? Should I empty my account? That's all. Who should I call? What should I do? Should I disappear? What, what anything you want me to do? That's all. I'm just asking. What aside from the things I've told you, what would you have me do? What would you have me sacrifice? Thank you, Jesus.